Furniture that is both cheap and high quality is one thing we can take for granted today because of how easy it is to get. However, it wasn't always like this. Once upon a time, furniture was an expensive commodity, especially in places like Sweden. Now we can conveniently get cheap, ready-to-assemble furniture for a relatively low cost. For this, we have a gifted dyslexic kid to thank. Ingvar Fyodor Kamprad struggled with school because of his learning disability. Though he managed to complete high school, he never attended college. However, all through his life, he displayed a strong instinct for business. It was this instinct that he used to take his business from being in a tiny shed to becoming the world's largest furniture retailer. This is the story of IKEA. Welcome to Planet Biz. The Birth of IKEA On the 30th of March, 1926, on a farm called Elmterid near the small village of Agenarid in Sweden, a boy named Ingvar Fyodor Kamprid was born. Long before Kamprid was born, his paternal grandfather who owned the farm he was born on had committed suicide because his company was on the verge of bankruptcy. Ingvar's grandfather could not pay the mortgages that his company owed, and he saw no other way out. At the time Ingvar's grandfather killed himself, his son, Ahim, who would later on father Ingvar, was just a young boy. Ahim was left with his mother who ended up saving the company after her husband's suicide. She was a woman with willpower and perseverance, and Ingvar, her grandson, likely picked up these traits from her. The province where Ingvar lived was known for poverty. The people had to farm, but farming wasn't enough to survive because the ground was too rocky. To make ends meet, his mother owned a guest house, and his father owned a country store in Elmholt. Understanding the general hardship and wanting to help his family out, Ingvar began working very early in his life. When he was just five years old, he got his first job selling matches and pencils. At this tender age, he would buy pencils and matches in bulk and resell them to his classmates for a profit. His aunt helped him buy his first 100 boxes of matches. In the words of Campred, I still remember the pleasant sensation experienced by receiving my first profit. At the time, I was no more than five years old. By the time he was 10 years old, he had dabbled in selling various items, from fish to Christmas decorations. The only business companions he had were his trusty bicycle and his inborn instinct for business. Unfortunately, Ingvar had a problem. He was dyslexic. Even though this learning disorder made it hard for him to do well in school, his business sense always remained heightened. When he was just 17 years old, he had saved up some money. His father gave him a little more money as a gift for doing well in school despite his dyslexia. This money was used to pay the registration fees of the business firm the young man had always wanted. And so, IKEA was born. Coined from the owner's initials, Ingvar Kampred, and his place of birth, Elmterid Farm in Agunarid, the name IKEA was used to refer to the small shed from which Ingvar operated his registered business. It was far from being the multinational conglomerate that we know today. The experiment that changed it all. At the onset of his business, things weren't going smoothly. Ingvar tried to find ways to get products to customers at cheaper prices. He found that there was a high demand for pens, which were a novelty in the early 1940s. He took what he personally referred to as his first and last loan in his entire life and used the money to import pens. To attract customers, he offered a free cup of coffee and a bun to everyone who came into his shop. This turned out to be a wonderful idea as people kept flocking to his small shop in their numbers. As he promised, everyone got their free food. However, he quickly discovered that selling pins didn't have a future as a business. So he stepped out of the pin trade and kept the profit to invest somewhere else. Fortunately, even though the pins didn't work out as a business, the idea for opening a restaurant at IKEA stores stemmed from the way food attracted customers to his store. And that idea has been a profitable one for IKEA even till now. Ingvar stumbled into the furniture business as a mere experiment. After deciding to invest his money from pins into something else, he saw an ad in an agricultural magazine from a furniture seller who was his main competitor. And according to him, he decided to try his hand in the furniture business. And what would you know, it turned out to be a successful experiment. So successful, in fact, that most of IKEA's profits today comes from the sales of furniture. Furniture sale, which I started out by chance and solely in order to outdo my competitors, has determined my fate, Ingvar once said, accurately describing the wonderful turn of events. 
Before he began selling furniture, he looked for places where he could find the cheapest furniture to buy. He began by selling replicas of his uncle's kitchen table. With time, he expanded his collection and added more pieces of furniture for sale. Each piece of furniture sold in his store and was given a special name because his dyslexia didn't allow him to remember numeric names of items. So for instance, a chair that didn't have an armrest was known as Root. IKEA began to distribute booklets among its customers. Over the years, these booklets have evolved and eventually become the modern IKEA catalogs. When his furniture range debuted, Ingvar told his customers that IKEA would offer more furniture options if customers were interested. They were, and that is how he continued to expand his business. The Boycott Things took an unfortunate turn for IKEA in 1955. Ingvar had bought a small, old factory in Sweden and began producing his own furniture. This way, the furniture was produced at a much cheaper rate for sale at his store. His low prices were strange for Sweden, where furniture had, prior to that, been seen as an expensive commodity. This definitely did not go unnoticed. Furniture manufacturers boycotted Ingvar and IKEA. They protested against his low prices and asked that they be increased. The Swedish Federation of Wood and Furniture Industry persuaded loggers to cease all business interactions with IKEA. This, however, did not deter Ingvar. He maintained his mission to provide affordable furniture to customers while still making a profit. As he was known to say, the vast majority of people don't have six-figure amounts in the bank and don't live in enormous apartments. It is for such people that I created IKEA, for everybody who wants a comfortable house in which to live well. In response to the actions of the loggers and the rest of the Swedish furniture industry, Ingvar Kamprad decided to import furniture components, which he was able to get at cheap rates from Polish suppliers. To the displeasure of the people who boycotted him, Ingvar opened up the first IKEA showroom in 1953 in Elmhult. Five years later, a 72,000 square foot store was opened. All the attempts to shut him down proved futile. The innovation that changed the world of furniture retail. In the early years of IKEA, the delivery trucks that they used were milk trucks. The cost of delivery was something Ingvar wanted to reduce as much as possible. He got the solution to his dilemma in the early 60s when he went on a visit to the United States. That was where he was first exposed to the cash and carry trade system. Ingvar liked the fact that customers could pay in cash and carry the goods away themselves. No need for a delivery truck. He began using this method, but he improved on it. The IKEA parking lots were more spacious in anticipation for the car boom that had begun in Sweden. People were willing to travel far distances to do their shopping. Ingvar's visit to the United States also led to the creation of flat pack furniture, which has now been adopted by furniture suppliers all over the world. With the flat pack system, the furniture is ready to assemble. The buyer takes it home and follows detailed instructions within the pack to set up the furniture. The assembly process is simple and can be carried out without any special woodworking skills. This made the furniture easier to carry and cheaper to transport. This greatly reduced transportation as well as labor costs and Ingvar noticed that customers actually enjoyed assembling their furniture themselves. To encourage people to shop at IKEA, they started selling their customers roof racks for carrying furniture on top of cars. The spacious parking lots, the roof racks, and especially the introduction of flat pack furniture did a wonderful job in driving customers to IKEA. As a result of these brilliant, well-executed plans, the company's sales doubled in just one year. It was a breakthrough for the company. In 1963, IKEA began expanding beyond the borders of Sweden. It opened its first overseas store in Oslo, Norway. Over the next 50 years, about 300 IKEA stores opened all over the world. Now, about six decades later, IKEA has over 400 stores around the world and more than 200,000 employees and makes revenue of billions of dollars every year. Before Ingvar Kamprad died at the age of 91 years old, he was one of the richest people worldwide and currently, IKEA is the largest furniture retailer in the entire world. His story teaches us that everyone can rise above their circumstances and achieve success through dedication. Taking advice from Ingvar Kamprad himself, the word impossible has been and must remain deleted from our dictionary. This is the story of how a dyslexic kid turned a small shed into a billion dollar furniture empire. For more inspiring business stories, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. This is Planet Biz.